he will talk about joint work with uh, Li Wei Wang, uh, Xin Yu Zhai, and Kai Zhang on generalization bound of uh, SGLD. Thanks for the introduction. Okay. okay. So uh, I'm Wen Longmo from UC Berkeley. I'm very happy to talk about uh, our work on generalization error for SGLD. Uh, for non-convex learning, we provide like two theoretical viewpoints. This is joint work with uh, uh, Li Wei Wang from Peking University, Xi Yu Zhai from MIT, and uh, Kai Zheng from Peking as well. So the motivation of this work is uh, relatively different uh, from the previous work, is that we are going to, ask, we are going to understand the means of generalization for like large non-convex models. And uh, like, uh, one of the motivating examples is like in deep neural networks. Everyone in this room knows that uh, generalization error can be controlled by some, with high probability by some uniform model capacity. But this is actually really large in deep neural networks and uh, like a, a lot of uh, like large non-convex models. And actually people show that, uh, for example, deep neural network can fit like uh, independent drug marker random labels. But in their experiments, they also show that uh, to feed those labels, labels, you need to take longer time. So uh, this gives you some uh, intuition that it might be that the generalization error can be controlled by the algorithm itself uh, in some like dimension independent way. Or uh, at least it doesn't need to have a explicit depend dependence on the dimension of your problem and uh, the model capacity. So we turn to like algorithm dependent generalization bound. There are a few works in this field, in, uh, in, like, uh, but most of them are focused on the convex setup. There are one work which gives a bound in the non-convex setup, which is hard at all, but their bound have exponential dependence on time. And as we will show later that this is uh, somehow like inevitable. So the key, that's the key technical difficulty when you deal with non-convex loss first is that you, you, don't, you, don't, you cannot rely on that your, your algorithm convert to some uh, global optimal or uh, you convert to some stationary distribution because it to takes too long time. And uh, the second thing is that uh, the funny, funny picture about uh, the stability analysis. So if your current iteration is here, around th th this, this like saddle point, and if your loss surface moves a bit by change of one data point, and you can, at first, your gradient method will convert to one of the local minima. And if you change a bit, it will be converting to another local minima. That means that uh, in the non convex learning problems, the gradient updates are naturally expensive. If you couple them in a naive way, it will be naturally expensive in the original Euclidean space. By expensive, I mean that uh, the current, like, if you have two trajectories, and uh, if you do one update, and uh, their error will be expanding with some uh, multiple factor. So then we turn to the SGLD algorithm. Uh, there are a lot of uh, previous talks that uh, introduce this work, th th this algorithm, and uh, it is discretization of laundry diffusion. So here we con consider a stochastic gradient version of that. And it is uh, widely used in sampling and optimization. If you don't trust me, like, uh, if you are interested in sampling, there are like you can refer to like previous talk. And if you are interested in its optimization pr property, you can see the next talk. But in this talk, we are going to focus on the generalization error, which is the gap between training error and test test error. So uh, the first two we are using the first theoretical viewpoint is uh, stability analysis. So uh, stability theorem told us that the expected generalization error is controlled by the uniform stability. And it can, you can take the expectation which is back to your randomized algorithm. And the key observation, which makes this analysis significantly different from the stability analysis in the previous work, is that the semi group itself of the laundry algorithm is not expensive in a space of measures. And the, the way we do that is we, we, we take the, like, we, we control the uh, loss by basically a difference between the two distributions in the space of measures in terms of their squared Hylander distance. And we take time derivative with, with that. And by doing some integration parts, we arrive at this bound. Beta is the temperature parameter, and L is the Lipschitz parameter. 
And for pipe based theory, a uh, pipe based theory theorem told us that uh, the, expect the generalizing error is controlled by the KR divergence between your output distribution and some fixed prior uh, divided by n. And uh, we take Gaussian prior here and we add some L2 re regularization. This L2 regularization is actually essential here because here we want, in, in our calculation, here comes the term uh, induced by the gradient of uh, uh, your Gaussian prior, which is, if we, if we just accept this term, it will give you another dependence on norm of your parameter. So we cancel it with L2 regularization term, and we use log sublex inequality. And you can see that it's not just, if you compare with Gaussian measure, it's not just non-expensive, actually contractive. You have some like a multiple factor which is smaller than one. And uh, here we finished the, we finished the continuous time analysis, which is cool. And we show that the generalizing error of the continuous time diffusion is good. And what do we do for the discrete time? I think in a lot of previous work, people like do the like discretization analysis. And your discretization error will be depending on your step size. And you have to take your step size to be small, but that is uh, not what we actually want. And what we do is that uh, we directly construct a continuous time process whose runtime marginal distribution exactly corresponds to the discrete time process as your discrete time points. Here, here are some, some plots. If you do discretization error, you can see that the, the error can be large at some point. And if you do interpolation instead of discretization, it looks better. And it's for stability, we use Brown motion with drift. And for pack based theory, we use Einstein Wollenbach process. And so here comes our, to com uh, our conclusion. For stability analysis, we basically get some bounds like this. We uh, the generalizing bound is depending on the basically some Lipschitz parameter and the square root of uh, aggregate step size through the algorithm. And we achieve like one or n rate. And our pair pack based bound is uh, different from the stability bound in a few points. The first thing which is bad is that we achieve only like one or square root n rate. But the good news is that first, uh, you can remember that in previous bounds, uh, we have uh, some uh, dependence on Lipschitz parameter, which can be really large. But here we replace it by basically the gradient you take along the path. And uh, the second thing is that uh, the contribution from each step is decaying exponentially, and the decay factor depends on your L2 regularization. So, why this is useful for like a very large non-convex model such as deep neural networks? Uh, the first thing is that, uh, as we can see, that uh, as in our motivation, the generation bound is depending on the aggregate step size, the total time that it takes. And you can see that if you train longer, it can be likely to overfeed. And the second thing is that uh, people found in experiments that SGD uh, can be gener can generate better than gradient descent. And it seems that the randomness, randomness helps. Although we do not directly analyze SGD, we analyze SGLD, but it provides si similar intuition. And the last thing is that uh, test, uh, test loss can continue to decrease even if uh, the training loss be become zero. This might be because that uh, in our pack based bound, the gradient norm of the few last steps can be like even smaller. So thanks for listening. Questions? Yes, we yeah, talk. Thanks for this suggestion. I think uh, we actually think of uh, differential privacy, and uh, differential privacy can be think of, can be thought as uh, some maximal, you know, of uh, like uh, be between the ratio of uh, 
like two neighboring data set. But here we are taking some average notion, which makes it possible to make the bound better. Okay, uh, let's thank the speaker and uh, now it's time. And are you